We're at Tom Riley's shop looking at the XP82 twin Mustang. This is the North American XP82, designed in 1943, very late 43, 44, 45, to be an escort, escort fighter for B-29s from Saipan or Tinian to Japan. They came to North American, Edgar Schmood was there at North American, and Hap Arnold, the head of the Army Air Corps, came to North American and asked them for a twin-engine fighter that was 50 faster than a Mustang and had six hours further range, and would carry two pilots. And this is what they came up with. Edgar Schmoot at Pencil sketched this airplane back in 1941, pulled out the draw for Hap Arnold and showed him the picture, and Hap Arnold said, build it. The problem is none of them got finished to see World War II. This one first flew on 15 April 45, but it didn't see any service because we had conquered closer islands so the single engine Mustangs could run the higher power and keep up the B-29s. So the fuel issue was not for the single engine Mustangs any longer. But these saw a lot of service in Korea. They sent quite a few of them over to Korea. In fact, the first uh, 282s shot down the first three Russian fighters for Korea. And now there are only five that still exist. 1953, they all went to scrap when the F-86 Sabre and the following airplanes came in line. Uh, the, there are only five that still exist, three in Air Force hands which will never be civilian, and one that belongs to Pat Harker, which is an E-model with Allison engines, and this is the XP first to fly with Merlin engines. The XP-82 and all the following ones were designed to be escort fighters, so they had 650 caliber machine guns mounted in the center, and they're M3s, which is 700 rounds per minute. So you're out of ammunition within about 20 some odd seconds of holding the trigger down. Very lethal weapons, reach out a long way away and touch you. When we decided to restore this airplane, we decided to go back to a thousand percent original. In other words, the left-hand turning Merlin engine, which is this one right here. Uh, this is filtered air, so if you're in desert climate, you can flip a switch and pull in induction air that's filtered. Uh, we've CAD plated all of the hardware, number one CAD plate, which is a silver color. We spectrographed the yellow paint, and we used all the original relays the open relays that were found at ET Supply. We even put the pedostatic system hole back in the in the, the correct place and we left the drilled hole in it where it was it was wrong and after the first flight they realized that pedostatic needed to be relocated so we left that mistake in it. We even have the original boresight level which was a 1943 part number and we found it brand new in the old 1940s box at Granger in Orlando, mounted on the left side of the fuselage. Inside here, this is the right-hand fuselage, and it's almost identical left fuselage. We have found every original World War II radio and with all the original cannon plugs and rewired it with all the correct color. And inside here, we even found the original fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher is easy to come by. The brass mount was really hard to come by. And then further down is the black detonator switch, which blows up all the radios with a small dynamite charge in case you bail out and the airplane crashes and at a 20G impact, the igniter goes off and it blows up the radio so the Japanese and the Germans did not get the uh, data inside the radios.
This XB82 came from Walter Soplata, who was a collector back in the 1950s. He was able to buy it from NACA, the predecessor of NASA, where it was a test bed, and it was there from 1945 to 19, uh, right at 1950. It skidded off an icy runway in Cleveland and bent the center section. So in 1950, they decided, well, we don't need any more. They cut it apart with a chainsaw, and he bought the remains of it.